show you that the scriptures in the Old Testament and the New Testament all count. And uh, the Testament is a will. And so the Old Testament is updated by the New Testament, but not done away. And that's an important thing to understand. We're not doing away with Scripture. The Bible says the Scripture is forever settled. And uh, so it all matters, but it does need to be in proper perspective. Amen. We welcome everybody here. Thank you for being here. This is really a good looking group. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're good looking. <laughs> Praise God. We had an awesome weekend with things happening. Um, and yesterday we had a beautiful wedding. I don't know what happened to them. They should, should be in church today. I guess they're having their own church. <laughs> anyway, maybe they didn't make it back. They went to Las Vegas. Proverbs 29 and verse number 18. It's a simple verse and it just launches a thought in your mind and says where there's no vision, the people perish. And then in contrast, kind of interesting, it says he that keepeth the law, happy is he. How many want to be happy? Amen. Amen. Where there's no vision, the people perish. You may be seated. <coughs> Amen. Sometimes God gives dreams. The Bible says in Joel, it says in the last days the Lord would pour out His Spirit. Your old men will dream dreams. I guess that's because they're sleeping. And your young men will see visions. That's because they're awake. And uh, the point is, is that we're going to hear from God. And uh, <clears throat> so sometimes you have a dream and uh, how many have dreams? Yeah. How many remember your dreams? <laughs> How many have dreams you forget? Sometimes you forget. You had a dream and you wake up and you, you, you try to grab it and it sort of slips. And, but the dreams are so realistic. And, uh, <clears throat> and it's, they're real. And yet some of them are bizarre and crazy. <clears throat> We usually try to put some kind of a meaning to a dream. And uh, we have to be careful with that. Um, anytime you speak for God, uh, you need to be careful. Even in your own mind, if you equate something to be from God, um, that's, that's easy to do, easy to make a mistake doing. And so, my rule of thumb for dreams is tell a dream as a dream. And don't necessarily make it anything unless God specifically gave you instruction and you know it's from God. But uh, usually a dream is something you just you have in your mind and you're not sure what all it means. But uh, you got to be careful what you try to make of it. It might just be that you made too much pizza, or too many enchiladas, or whatever it is that you eat. Um, but then it could have a meaning. Dreams could could have a meaning. And uh, sometimes, if God gives a dream, it could be a warning. It could be direction. And uh, there were dreams in the Bible. The king had a dream. Daniel was able to interpret the dream. Uh, Joseph was able to interpret the dream. And, uh, so those dreams were from God. And, uh, and he put the interpreter in a special place and made them significant. The Lord could have given the king the interpretation. For example, you know, when Joseph had a dream, the king had a dream, he, he dreamed about seven cows. There were seven fat cows and seven skinny cows. And uh, 
and those skinny cows ate the fat cows and they didn't get any fatter. And so the king is troubled, he's trying to figure out what does this mean? And then we find out that Joseph can interpret the dream. And uh, since Joseph was able to do that, he became very important to Pharaoh and, and the kingdom. And it brought in all of his people in a special place. Um, and put him in charge. So if you have the answer from God, it, it's something for people to be willing to follow, if it really is from God. And then, of course, there's a lot of fraud here, people quoting things from God and saying they had dreams and giving destiny to you and vision to you and saying things about you, and, and you have to be careful with that. Some people are just promoting themselves, or they have their own agenda. In, in history, back in the 1800s here in America, there were a couple of ladies in the Midwest in Oklahoma that uh, ran the whole town by their dreams and their tongues and interpretation. And they told who to get married and who to marry and who to leave town and who to move and what to buy. And they just pretty much ran the town with their supposed direction from God. And uh, what you got to remember is God's in charge. And when He wants to give direction, He can. Uh, but He doesn't need people helping Him like that. They were imposing their own will and their own whatever. I, I suppose it, it got busted up somewhere when, <clears throat> when they missed giving the right direction. And so I'm suspect of anybody trying to say something from God. The Bible says if there's a prophecy that if it comes true, then that's a true prophet. If it doesn't come true, then it's a false prophet. And uh, you have to be careful even with that because you have part to do with it coming true. So if Brother Winslow comes and gives you a word and you don't act upon it, then it may not happen. I think Brother Winslow, in my opinion, is like the best guy in the, in the gift of, of prophecy and whatever else other gifts he operates. Because his point is, is I'm not going to try to do anything. I'm just going to speak if God tells me to speak. When God says to, I will speak. And some pretty amazing things have been documented. And so there is such a thing as hearing from God, from a prophet, a man of God, and, uh, and it being very specific to you. And it builds your faith. Helps you to know that God knows who you are and right where you are. And Brother Winslow, there's a lot of guys like this, and they're not all that. Um, but you sort of, you know, the Bible says you know by your fruit, so if it just is like a show to showcase their abilities uh, it's really not for the glory of God and uh, there are some phenomenal things I, one, one guy came here years ago and uh, in, in different churches one church he went to he called out 65 people's names in the church Brother George Morris and he didn't know anybody he was able to call out names tell you your name, can tell you your birthday, it can tell you I mean, it's just supernatural ability. Um, <clears throat> and he was very strong in the Word, but, you know, I'm not sure what all happens if somebody calls your name, and if God calls your name, you know, you want to hear him, what, he, what, what he has to say. And if it's just calling your name, you know, you wonder, is this for God, or is this for man? And anytime we're involved in, in being the chain and the voice and the connection, there is an issue of taking the glory to ourselves. That's what happened to Lucifer. So, but Brother Winslow's like one of the best guys I've ever seen. He's just smooth, he's confident, and he's right on, and he don't, he don't miss. 
and uh, he, he doesn't have to do it. He doesn't force it. He's not trying. He just says something, and he, he's on. So one story is pretty, pretty funny. He called this lady up and said, you're going to have a baby. And the whole church laughed. And, uh, of course, you know, God is able to do anything, right? But the lady last year before or so of that had a total hysterectomy. So all of the business inside of her that would produce a baby was gone. And uh, he told her she was going to have a baby and the whole church laughed. And uh, of course, as confident as he is, he said, don't laugh at God. And uh, the next year she had a baby. Then he laughed at them. <laughs> so if God wants to put everything back in there, he can do it. Amen. We've had people that had an x-ray, they had a lung removed, and they go back a couple years later, and the doctor said, you're not that person because I took your lung out, and you have two lungs now. It's like, really? And they're, they're just scratching their head and re-x-rayed and trying to figure it. I mean, if God wants to do something, He can do it. Amen. So, if it's the purpose of God, and you're 90 years old and you need to have a baby, better get some baby clothes out because God can make it happen. It all has to do with His purpose. But it's for God. And it's for the glory of God. And sometimes, you know, we're in the picture. So, it's fun to be in the picture when God's doing amazing things. But it really ends up being for God's glory. So, if it comes to give a word, uh, you need to act upon it. And uh, that's important. I hold this course today has a purpose. And we're just kind of warming you up in your mind to get you going and thinking. People do this, you know, in the dark, telling scary stories. And we're just doing it for God. And getting your mind in the direction of faith and believing in God and knowing that God knows you. He knows who you are. He knows where you are. He knows what's going on in your life. And that's important. Where there is no vision, the people perish. And uh, the Lord gave me a little statement here. So, so if you have a dream, don't just tell it as a dream and Kind of wait and see what happens. Don't uh, don't make too much of it unless you know you know for sure um, that it's from God and that God gave you the dream. That's important. So I guess this will be my title today. God believes. And what you're going to be. Yeah. Not what you used to be. Yeah. God believes in what you're going to be. Not what you used to be. And the question is, do you? Yeah. God believes in what you're going to be, not what you used to be. Now you know what you used to be. And you pretty much know what you are today. But you don't know what you're going to be. Let that sink in. You're not sure what you're going to be. You're not sure what the future holds. You know for sure what you used to be. And that becomes your identity. That becomes your personal perception. Perception is a pretty important issue. You could be somebody great. We've had some great presidents that public perception has perceived them to be losers and liars and all kinds of things. And the media and everybody else put it out, but I promise you in history, 
and in the future people are going to look back and they're going to admire some people that that the public perception didn't admire because perception has to do with what you think and perception could be wrong but it is important and it's kind of like the cliche that people use you know I don't care what people think well you ought to care because what people think is their perception you can help that or hurt it and, and if you're God you can you know go down and eat with publicans and sinners and say you know I don't care what you think but if you're not God then you probably need to be careful with what you allow people to think the Bible says don't let your good be evil spoken of and have a good testimony about your life and so we need to be careful about perception perception is important and uh, some things you know you can't help what people conclude um, some lady down the street walked up to somebody here in the parking lot a while back and just spewed out a whole bunch of stuff about this church and the people that go to this church and all kinds of things just you know and it's all her perception I don't know how she got it I don't know who she is I'd like to talk to her but anyway I like this church I like the people in this church for the most part everybody in this church is interested in making it to heaven and uh, different people at different stages certainly not perfect certainly not flawless but you know we're here to serve God. Amen. And so some people's perception is just way off. Some people might think we're weird or crazy or whatever. And some perceptions we can't help. But perception is important. And uh, so you don't want to hurt it. You'd like to help it if you could. And uh, when a president becomes president, there's a, there's a department uh, that take care of his public relations and to you know show him in a good light and show him you know you, you won't see bad pictures you won't hear bad clips hopefully he doesn't get caught saying something on the mic when he doesn't know the mic's on or whatever but you know PR is is uh, something that has to be worked on because what they're trying to work on is the public's perception and and for the for the beginning of our current president, you know, he, he ran on the need change. And everybody agreed to need change, and they just didn't know what kind of change they were getting. But uh, they ran on the perception of this is going to be a good change. And it's still a ticket that people are going to run on. Now we need change again. What kind of change are we going to get? And the perception has to do with what's in your mind as well as what's in the mind of the public. And it's important. My point today is, what is your perception about you? Forget the rest of the world. Forget what they think. Forget who they are. What is your perception about yourself? What do you think about yourself? And most people in the world and most people in the church have an issue with perception about themselves based on their past, based on their personal feelings and confidence, based on their present, based on their experiences, based on what's happened. Some people feel like, I just have bad luck, bad things just happen to me. And they'll say things, it's just my luck that, you know, I'm going to have a blowout or somebody's going to rob me things are not going to go good. So my question is, what is your perception of yourself? Because this scripture applies to that, and that is where there's no vision, the people, now we're talking about you and me, the people perish. So forget everybody else in the world. We have acknowledged that perception is important. What is the perception that you have about yourself what do you think about yourself what do you think about yourself and 
God. So here's a little reason that people have. Maybe they didn't say it. Maybe they didn't think it in their mind. But it is what they perceive. And it is what they act upon. And it's kind of based on, you know, we base everything usually on our own self. Our own abilities. So sometimes we get the feeling that we're just sort of out left field and forgotten. God doesn't care. God's too busy. God's way up there. He's way out there. And we're not really important. And that's kind of because that's how we are. Some things in our life are front and center and priority. Some things are forgotten. If all of the things in your life had a voice, some of the things in your life would be saying, what about me? You forgot about me. In our school, we have case number nine in training, and it's called monkey business. And it's about taking on responsibilities that you're supposed to. And it's also about taking on other people's responsibilities that they're supposed to, but you took on their responsibilities and you took on too much. And you're little zoo's got too many monkeys to feed and you can't feed them all. So you end up sticking some in a drawer here and some in a drawer there. You end up, you know, neglecting some of them. And some of them die and pretty soon you have a bad smell around and you have this whole training pace about what you're supposed to do and what you're not supposed to do and what you're supposed to let other people do and about not taking on too much so it's important in your own mind to think about your own self and not think about it in your perspective, but in God's. Because God is so good that He doesn't make junk. He doesn't make people that don't count. And He's got a plan for you and He's got a destiny for you and you might feel like, well, I'm not important. Brother Cooper's important. Brother Cooper's got all these stories he's told. He's got a background. He's, he's raised in the church. God had a plan for him. All of that is really supposed to inspire you for your plan. It's not just supposed to make you think, well, God only had a plan for me. No, God has a plan for everybody because he doesn't have problems with pace number nine. He doesn't have problems with managing every important person in the world. Every last person is worth more than the whole world. And so when it comes to God, you gotta, you got to understand how great God is and not perceive it based on your own ability. If I was God, I mean, I'm a pastor, okay? So I pray for 339 people, 329 people every day. Last count. There's a few extras right here um, that you've just come recently, and I've added your name to the list. But I, you know, I try to bring in my mind every person that I'm trying to pastor every day, and a lot, a lot of other people, family, friends, uh, other ministers, other churches, whatever. And the reason I do that, several reasons, but one reason is is I'm trying to keep it all in perspective. I'm trying to not forget somebody. I don't want to be, you know, pastoring you and forget you. So I remember you every day. And then sometimes I'll remind you. I pray for you every day. And some people that I haven't seen for years, they haven't been in this church for years, I don't know where they are, I pray for them. And when they show up here, then I... I tell them, I've been praying for you every day. I told people that yesterday that I hadn't seen for quite some time. I told them, I, I pray for you every day. And, and it might sound like a lot, 329, but there's a whole lot more people in the world than that, and God doesn't miss one. There's not one that doesn't count. In fact, He said He is so detailed that not even a sparrow falls that he doesn't know. So compute that in your mind a little bit because you are way more important than a sparrow. Yeah. 
When I'm driving down the street all the time, I'll hit my brakes for his parent. And I worry about them because they're in the middle of the street. They're all there. There's some little ones there, and big ones there. And they need to fly out of the way. And my car is pretty quiet. Sometimes the motor's not even on. And here comes a car. And I'm watching all those sparrows. And you know what I think about? If one of these sparrows don't make it, God knows it. So what he's telling you is that there's no such thing as anybody here not counting or that God forgot you and He doesn't know you, that you don't matter. You've got to get the perception of you trying to do it out because if you were trying to manage that much, you couldn't do it. There would be somebody forgotten somewhere. As hard as I try, I'm not God. So we need to give God credit in our vision, in our perception for ourselves, that God formed you, God made you, God planned you, God's got a future for you, and He doesn't see you based on who you were or what you were, but He sees you based on what you're going to be. And the thing that He's trying to get you to do is to buy into that vision. You say, well, I don't even know what it is. That's true. But think about God. God is so good and so great. He does not do penny any stuff. He doesn't do mediocre things. He does great things. Now, sometimes we take great things for granted. Sometimes we take small things for granted. We think they don't really count. But God does great things. So He's got a plan for you and in your personal perception of yourself you need to stop and think you know what? I don't feel like I'm good. I don't feel like I'm great. I don't feel like I have a destiny. I don't. But that's based on my own personal perception. Now what? You've got to at least let God have a perception in your mind of what He sees you're going to be. None of us know what we're going to be. None of you knew years ago that you would be sitting in this church. And maybe you don't even really understand that of all the things in your life that really matter, you being in the kingdom of God is the most important thing. I know we work jobs and we travel and we do things and we, we have entertainment and we have pleasures and our whole life is a whole life of a lot of things, but there's nothing more important than this right here. And it's not because of me. It's not because of the church. It's not because of an organization. It's because this is our connection to God. It's the most important thing going in the whole world. And it's the place where God wants to give you the right perception about you. Now, I got a mom sitting over here, 91 years old. My whole life she told me, God's hand is on you. God's eyes are on you. You're going to make it. And I don't think she knew what it was going to be. God didn't tell her what I was going to do, what I was going to be. She just knew God. And she knew God's good and God does good things. And she, because I'm her son, believed that God was going to do something great in his life. And you can assume that of God because that's who God is. But then you have to buy into that vision. And my whole life, my whole life as a child all the way growing up, I heard that constantly to where eventually it began to sink into my mind, God's got a plan. You can see God's plan in your life by looking back. They say hindsight is 2020. 2020 vision is perfect. And when you look back, you can see things in your life where God did things. If you can see God having done things in your past, then you can very much assume that He's in your present. And you can very much assume that He's in your future. But He doesn't tell you everything. Sometimes He might give you a dream. He gave Joseph a dream. And, 
and, and the problem is, is between the dream and the dream coming true, there's a lot of stuff that you didn't expect. And it might cheat you out of your dream if you're not careful. But God's got a plan for you. He didn't leave you in a drawer somewhere. He didn't forget you on the backside of the desert somewhere. God's got a plan for you. And I need you to believe that. Socially, we put people in places. And you need to forget socially. You don't have to try to be something great for God. God's already got a great plan for you. But socially, we put people in places. We, in our minds, we think that person is this, and they're never going to change. And God might want to change you. God might want to do something in their life that's not what you expected. And if it is God, you're going to have to adjust your perception because when God does something in somebody's life, you didn't, you didn't think that was going to happen that way. So God wanted to do something in a man's life by the name of Saul of Tarsus who was a mass murderer of Christians, a persecutor. And God wanted to use him. So he smacked him down. He revealed himself to him and prepared him to receive direction. And then he called on a man to, to talk to Saul. <laughs> And the perception shows up in, in, in everybody's minds. Now, wait a minute. This guy is our enemy. This guy is bad. This guy is no good. We want to stay away from him. But God's already worked on him. Now God's wanting to have Ananias bring him the gospel. I mean, that's like giving him the best thing you've got to give him. And this guy doesn't deserve it. Your perception of him is he's bad, he's our enemy, and now God's wanting him to give him the best thing I have to offer. So you've got to give up your perception of yourself based on who you are and who you were and what your past is and, live, and let God know you for your future. Because if you would buy into the vision, that's kind of what happens when Brother Winslow comes, and maybe some of you don't even know who that is. You will sooner or later, because we have him come by every once in a while, and he has several gifts. He can just speak into your life and say things that you probably need to get to take. Probably need to write it down, because it's direction from God. And God is giving direction right now. I could be operating a gift right now. Could be the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge. We don't really raise our hand and say, oh, right now I'm operating this gift. It's not for us to be identified. It's for God. Yeah. So God could be talking to you right now. And you've got to sit up and take notice because God's trying to help you have a perception about yourself that's different than your past and what you think. And God wants to know you for who you are. So, so think about it. God knows the end from the beginning. He knows what the Apostle Paul is going to be and going to do. And he's trying to tell Ananias, I want you to tell this guy what he needs to do to be saved. And Ananias is saying, in my perception, he's a murderer. He's, a, he's an enemy. No... I can't fit that in my mind. God is not looking at a murderer. God is looking at an apostle. God is looking at a man that is going to glory in tribulation. That is going to... He, he says, I glory in what happens to me because it's for the Lord. And I don't mind. I'm glad to suffer for the Lord. And he lists the things that happen to him. He had a lot of things happen to him. But he was a tremendous, powerful man for God. And that's the perception God had for him before he ever knew it. All he knew was 
He thought he was doing good, fighting Christians, and then God knocked him down, blinded him, and he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the answer from heaven said, I'm Jesus. That's all he needed to know. He woke up without being able to see, and he got a revelation of who God was. And now he is a different man. Now he is ready to receive instruction. Now he has a whole destiny in front of him. And God sees him as the Apostle Paul. That's who Saul was, by the way. Saul's name got changed to Paul. And we know him as the guy that wrote a lot of the New Testament scriptures. And he, all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. So when men wrote it, they wrote it under the inspiration of God. It's not like they just wrote it out of their own head. God put it in their mouth and in their pen. And it's inspired, forever settled word from God. And so understand when God saw Saul, he saw Paul. Nobody else did. Everybody else had a public perception of who that guy was. And if they were on that side, they thought, you know, he's our lead man. He's after the Christians and let's get him. And on the other side, the Christians are saying, we, that guy's our enemy. We don't want nothing to do with him. And God's got a perception that's way different than everybody else's. Amen. So I'm not wanting you to worry about the perception of somebody else today. I'm wanting to worry about your perception of you. You are going to be great for God if you do what God wants. God will never intentionally make anybody a vessel of dishonor. If you're going to be a vessel of dishonor, that's your choice. But if you're going to volunteer to be a vessel, then you need to be a vessel of honor. And so, God doesn't intentionally make somebody, like, when it comes to betraying the Lord, somebody was going to do it. And, and, the, and the statement that God made was, woe to the man that, that does it. But it's going to have to be His choice. God's not going to bring you into this world to make you the Antichrist or to make you something bad. So if you don't buy into God's vision for yourself, then the world gives you one. Your job gives you one. Your friends give you one. They give you a perception of what you're supposed to be. And you have to decide if you want to buy into that or not. When I was on the job, when I first came to Los Angeles, I was on the job, and my boss kept telling me, you have great leadership potential. I would smile, that was, I liked hearing that. <laughs> but your problem is, you, you're not a, a lifer here, you, you, we can tell you're not totally committed here. When we call on you to work overtime, you got to say yes, sir. If we need you, you got to be here. And of course, I'm a negotiator, so I would say, you know, if you can give me a heads up ahead of time, uh, I'll do my best. Because I want to be something besides just a plain regular worker. I'd like to be the supervisor. I'd like to be... You, you say I have tremendous leadership ability. Okay, fine. I, I like to be that. And they would call me in the office. You know, over the course of a few years, they called me in the office a number of times. And the issue was, you know, we see great potential in you, but you know, you're not you're not really committed on our team. Well, the problem was, is I was a pastor of a church, and when it came time to be in church, I'm the pastor. I got to be there. Small church, we're just getting started. We don't have a lot of people, but you know, I have to work a job. But when it comes time for church, I'm the guy that opens the door, I'm the guy that turns on the lights, I'm the guy that preaches the message, I'm the guy that leads the songs. I'm, I'm not going to miss that. And they knew it, 
And so they would say, you know, you're, you're, you're committed somewhere else. We know that. And they never promoted me. Never. They had a perception for me. They wanted to give me. But I had already bought into another perception. So I, I wanted to. I wanted their job. It would be more money. It would be a promotion. It would be whatever. But, but I had already bought into another perception that, that I couldn't budge. Now, I'm not saying you can't work during church, but I'm saying if a job is going to have you always work during church, you probably should need to get a different job. Because the most important perception going in your world, in this world, in eternity, is, is this right here. This is a vehicle to get us to heaven. It's the church. Not just the building. The building's nice. It's a place together. It's kind of an anchor. But the real church is the, are the people of God. Our association with one another, our fellowship, our interaction, what we do to one another, good and bad, is all part of what God is doing to get you ready to go to heaven. And He gave the ministry for the perfecting of the saints so that we could be ready to be the bride of Christ that we're going to we're going to stand in His presence having been perfected by the preaching of the Word of God. And that's our, our job. So, this is a perception that the devil would like to cheat you out of and the world would like to give you a different one. And, you know, and there in the world's God is called the dog. And so... You probably ought to take an extra job and you ought to need, you need to make an extra job so you can do whatever you want to do in life. And our perception here is, is if you honor God, God's going to give you all the dollars you need. But you're buying into a perception that, you know, my life belongs to God. And I promise you, living for God is going to be a whole lot more fun and a whole lot more rewarding and definitely more eternal. Amen. And anything that a perception this world will give you. Yeah. So they try to give you a perception. And uh, so if you can't be a movie star because you're not beautiful, maybe you can be wealthy. Maybe you can be powerful. Maybe you can have a job. But they're they're going to give you an identity. They're going to give you a perception. And you've got to decide, is this what my life is going to be about? Is this what I'm going to be? God has a perception to give you. God has a vision to give you. And God's vision... See, the devil always entices you with a big menu. This is what you're going to get. This is coming on the next ship. This is coming around the next corner. And he just entices you with a bunch of stuff and he's got you thinking it's going to be all be wonderful. And he's a liar. God's not enticing you with things... He's saying, trust me because I'm God and when I do things, it's awesome. You are never going to be sorry if you trusted in God and gave your identity to God. When it gets done, it's going to be way better than you could have ever done. So in my own life, that's what I have to do. I have to decide, am I going to put my life in God's hands or what am I going to do? I knew all of my life that God was working in my life. Well, that's true for everybody. That's what I'm trying to tell you today. It's true for everybody. It's not just true for me. I'm just a good testimony of somebody that bought into it. And you don't have to be a pastor. You don't have to be whatever. You just be whatever God has chosen for your perception. But you got to know it's going to be great. If you're a soul winner, you're going to have an eternal reward. If you're somebody that can say a right word at the right time, the Bible said it's better than pictures of gold and, and whatever of silver. You, you cannot be God's perception for you. And so it takes faith to say, I'm going to go for what God has. And you don't even know for sure what it is. But, I mean, I stood in line at graduation in Bible school and people asked me, what are you going to do? And I said, I don't know. I don't know. I could look back when they were giving me a license. They called me in because I graduated from Bible school. The, the, the protocol is now you're going to be a preacher. And uh, I had never preached. 
went to high school and Bible school, never preached a message. And so here I am standing before the district board to get a license, and they asked me why I want a license. And I felt like saying, I didn't call you, you called me. Which was true, but uh, I knew that was kind of like a smart aleck answer, so I bit my tongue on that one. And so then, I think God put it in my mind, because I was no nothing. I just followed the course. And here I am standing before Him, and I, and I just said, looking back, I see the hand of God in my life, and if this is the course for the future, I might as well follow it. And they said they liked that idea. They liked that. And then I got to thinking about what I said, and I realized, and I hadn't thought of that. I hadn't planned that. That wasn't my my thought. My thought was, you called me, I didn't call you. God's thought was, hey, look at what I've done already, and you can see what I'm going to do. So God's working in your life right now. And even though you don't know what all it's going to be, to be enticed with the carrot in front of the donkey, I promise you there's a whole lot more than a carrot out there. You, you need to manage your perception about yourself. It's easy in the flesh to feel bad. It's easy in the flesh to feel guilty. It's easy in the flesh to feel like you're a loser. And you've got the devil and the world telling you that something about you is wacky. If you don't do what they want. And their agenda is all selfishness. When I was, when I was in high school, it was a public high school. went to Christian grade school, but they didn't have a high school, so I went to high school. And the interaction of a person coming, a child, 13-year-old, coming from church and church school to public school uh, in 1964 was quite a revelation. It was a revelation to me to find out where they all were. And it was a revelation to them to find out what I was. So the first thing they found out was that I didn't drink. And they were determined. They were determined to get me to drink. And they would offer me drinks all the time. I mean, we're talking about just regular school. You want a beer? No, I don't drink. You want some vodka? No, I don't drink. This is going to really make you feel good. No, I don't drink. Usually for anybody that they did that to, they broke them down. But I, I just... I had no interest whatsoever at all. So one time we, we headed out in a car, I like cars. And so, you know, we took a ride in a guy's car and they had me in the back seat. And they said, you know, you want some pizza? And I said, sure. So they gave me a piece of pizza that had anchovies on it. And I don't like anchovies. And uh, I took a bite of it. And I was, you know, I mean, this was a setup. I didn't realize it, but they were, you know, so they handed me a beer or something. They gave me something to drink here like this. <laughs> and then I realized what, what it was about. They were determined that I was going to buy into their perception. Then I was kind of provoked. I'm thinking, you know, they got me in the back seat of the car and said, give me something to drink, give me anything, water, coke, or whatever. And here they're giving me liquor of some sort, whatever they, whatever they can give me to drink. And I'm thinking, you know, I, I mean, I didn't put it in what I'm saying here today, but that's really what it's about. They have an agenda, they have a perception, and they are determined. I mean, what good does it do them for me to drink? They don't do them one bit of good. They just, they just couldn't stand somebody that decided I have a different agenda than you. My life is going in a different direction. And if you really have a direction from God, I promise you the whole world is going to want to follow somebody that knows where they're going. 
everybody is going to do something that the world has given them as a perception. But if you're a child of God, it'll be like Daniel or the three Hebrew children. We're not bended and we're not bound. And they end up being the glory of God because they had an agenda that was different than the world. God doesn't see what you used to be. He sees what you're going to be. And I want you to see it today. There's no such thing as anybody here being a person that doesn't matter or doesn't count or that is any less. God does great things and only great things. So when you buy into what God has planned for you, everybody in your life is going to be pleased, excited, amazed, thrilled. They're going to be shocked. They're going to be dazzled in, and they're going to be amazed at how what God did in your life. All you need to do is keep giving God the glory for it. But God's got plans for every person in the building. If you're looking for a place in the kingdom of God, there's, there's a wide open field for anything that you can do. Whatever your talent is, give it to God. God wants to use it. But I'm telling you, it's important your perception of yourself can't be about who you used to be. It can't be about what you are today. It's got to be about what God's got planned. And God doesn't always just tell you everything, but He will, he will lead you in that plan. Everybody said amen. amen. Every point dies without an illustration, so let's look at something real quick here. Let's look at some people that didn't buy into God's perception. And let's ask the question of what it would have been if they would have. The first one is Lucifer. What if Lucifer had bought into what God's identity for him was? He was the, he was the main leader of heaven above Michael and Gabriel. Gabriel blows the horn. He's the messenger angel. Michael is a military angel fighting spiritual warfare. And Lucifer is the highest one and he is the angel of worship and praise and glory to God. And let's just suppose that he would have stayed in his place. The Bible says that his physical being was made up of seven musical instruments and that he could produce the most unbelievable music and sound for the glory of God than any being that God has ever made. We have a voice that we could sing and we have hands that we could clap. And that's probably about it. He was supernatural in his ability to praise God. My words are weak. To give you the concept and the idea and the sound is just, that's what the Bible says he was. But we will never know that because he didn't stay in his place. But what if he would have? What could have been done? A third of the angels would not have fallen if he wouldn't have. That was a major loss. What if Adam and Eve had never chosen to fall? They would have children and we would have come along somewhere along the line and, and we would not have a fallen nature. I don't know what the agenda would be, but it would certainly be better than what has happened to mankind if they would have decided to buy into God's agenda instead of the devil's. Balaam was trying to get a reward that didn't belong to him. And he's referred to even in the New Testament. What if he would have been a godly man that would have said that reward belongs to God? What difference would there be? And on down the line, Achan. Achan's whole family was destroyed. They were stoned. They were buried in a big mountain of rocks because of a lot of people who lost their loved ones in the war because of what Achan did. What if Achan wouldn't have done that? What if he would have obeyed? 
Absalom got the whole country behind him, only to find out that he didn't have God. And God already had an oak tree growing there, waiting for the day that he would hang in it. What if Absalom would have been faithful to his father and been a loyal son? What if Absalom's name meant something different to us than it does now? Is there anybody here that has ever named their son Absalom? Absalom wasn't a slob. Absalom wasn't a loser. Absalom was so sharp and smooth, he won the whole kingdom from his dad. He stood at the gate and convinced everybody, my dad's too busy and I can help you. I mean, with all that talent and ability, why didn't he buy into what God's agenda was instead of rebellion? I don't know why, but you can't get past God. I would rather buy into God's perception. It's kind of sad that when we say absolute, we instantly think of a rebellious person that had to be killed. But think of David now. David's heart was broken. That was his son. He did not glory in absolute being killed. He wept. He was sad. Why, Absalom, couldn't you buy into God's program? I don't know if you would have been the next king, but you would have been the son of a king and you would have been great in God's program. But you had to buy into somebody else's perception. Judas was an apostle and there's only 12. Why? Why did he have to buy into somebody else's agenda besides the Lord who he walked with for three and a half years and knew everything that God was able to do and yet he had to buy into a different agenda. An agenda about money. Money's a tool. The love of money is the root of all evil but there's nothing wrong with money just have it, use it, honor God with it, do the right thing with it, and you'll be blessed. And, but, but Judas had to make it a God. When he finally saw those 30 pieces of silver on the floor after he threw them back as what they really were, it was put in proper perspective. I should have bought into Jesus. And this thing on the floor is just a tool. It's nothing. It doesn't count. He traded his relationship with Jesus for money. We had a lady at her call me one time and you've heard the story but it's worth repeating and it's funny. I sat down in her house at 11 o'clock at night and she said, I want to give my inheritance to the church. And here it is. She puts the $120,000 cash across the table. And I'm like, 20, uh, 29 years old. I mean, I was, you know, I was like I just won the lottery. Along with that came several CDs of several other $100,000 that she just put it on the table and pushed it across. And after my six months lesson, I came to her house and pushed it back across the table. I said, this is your money, it's not mine. And uh, if you die, I'll take it if you want to give it, but I already have a job. And I can't be money, but I'm living for it. I'm living for Jesus. I'm doing what He says to do. And really what she did is she used that money to own me. Because the very day she gave it to me, the next day she called me and says, Oh, uh, you know, I just gave you 120000 Could you come over here? And, and after six months of that, I said, I get the back. I get the picture. <laughs> There's only one person that can own me, and that's God. So I said, here's your money back. When the time comes, and the time came, the court called me. They said, we have the most unbelievable, ugly, terrible 
person here that's claiming this money and we understand that there was a will written to your church and we would love to give this to you instead of to them because they have a terrible attitude. This lady's passed away and could you please come down to the court if you have a copy or if you have the will. I said, I don't have the will, I just have a copy and I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to give it to them. I already got what I needed out of it. That was a lesson. A lesson that $120,000 doesn't matter. You better stick with, you better forget the 30 pieces of silver and stick with Jesus. Yeah. Because he's got a whole lot more than $120,000. He's got your destiny in his hand. If you could possibly buy into the perception of what you're going to be in God. I'm still feeling the resistance of people sitting here saying, but I'm nobody. I'm not you. I'm not Abel. I'm not whatever. I'm just telling you, God does great things. He doesn't do mediocre things. He does great things. There's plenty of room in this world for people to do great things if they would just buy into what God sees that they're going to be. And so Saul of Tarsus bought it. Hook, line, and sinker. Okay, God. Now that I know who you are, I'll serve you. I'll obey you. I'll do whatever you want. And he's the one that said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the power of God and the salvation. He's the one that said, I glory in tribulation. I've been in perils of my brethren and my country. I've been, been a day and a night in the deep. Been boiled, been burnt, been, been put in prison. He's been through all kinds of things. And he said, I count it all joy to do this for God. And he's the one that said, I have fought a good fight and have kept the faith. Now there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness is not for me only, but to everyone who loves his appearing. We are living for Jesus Christ. Amen. And the world's perception of us is that we're weak-minded or whatever, but the fact is, it doesn't matter what they think, it's a matter of what you think about yourself. And I am not ashamed to be telling you this thing. If I was trying to sell you a product, I would be ashamed because it would be for me and it would be for my benefit. But I am not ashamed to preach the gospel to you and to tell you with all of my heart that if you give it all to God, you're going to be blessed. I don't go to bed thinking, I wonder if it will happen. I wonder if it can't come true. I wonder. No, I believe that God is able to do exactly what I'm saying. Amen. I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed. I don't need some other job. My job is to tell you that God sees what you're going to be. And you need to buy into that today. Let's stand. There's a lot of people that bought the dream. Jacob, Noah, Daniel, Stephen, Abraham, John, Paul, Joseph. They bought into the dream. They believed it.
they're very powerful. All of these people that Hebrews 11 talks about. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. All of these people obtained a good report. Cain offered a better sacrifice. On down the line it listed everybody all the way to Abraham and Daniel. It says, What shall I more say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, of Aaron, of Samson, of Jephthah, of David, also of the prophets, who through faith of new kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained the promise to stop the mouths of the lion, to quench the violence of fire, to keep the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong. Max Valley did flight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens, women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trials of cruel mockings and scourging, they more over in bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawed asunder, they were tempted, they were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. All these have obtained having obtained a good report through faith. They bought it to by faith. And they gave their whole life to serving God. And so, the first verse of the next chapter says, See, we are encompassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. These are the witnesses right here. They've all been there, they've all done that, and now it's our turn. Let us lay aside every weight and sin that does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that's set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Can you buy God's vision today for you? Not this church, not for me, not for leadership, not for somebody else, not for somebody talented, not for somebody great. For you, you. God's got a plan for you. Just trust Him to help Him. He does all things well. He does them good. And I want you to buy into this plan. Please, buy into God's plan. Reject all others. The devil's going to come. There's going to be deception. There's going to be tempting. Somebody's going to have another plan. I'm just telling you today. I don't know what God's plan is for you. I'm not responsible to tell you that. I'm just telling you He's got a plan for you. God's going to use you. Thank God for that. I'm inviting you down to the altar to buy into the plan. That doesn't automatically mean that you are where you are. I'm just saying it's a good step to take. Right now, I want to continue to commit and recommit. I want to continue to consecrate and dedicate my life to Him. Because He's got a plan that's way better than anybody else's. If I can get your perception of your own self to include what God wants, I promise you it's going to be great. If you listen to the devil's lies, he's got a, he's got a nice story to tell, but it's no good. Hallelujah. I'll choose you again.